Rishi Sunak rises to the UK Prime Minister's chair after Truss's tenure. Can he battle the odds, the economy, the British opposition and his own Conservative Party to succeed? And will the first British Asian of Indian origin to become Prime Minister actually come through for India and the Free Trade Agreement? Hello and welcome to Worldview at The Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. This is episode 85 and it's been a week of change in UK's 10, number 10 and number 11 Downing Street and a week of celebration for many in India as Rishi Sunak became the country's new Prime Minister. Of course, the first time a non-white Asian immigrant of Indian ancestry has done so after Liz Truss, the incumbent, who lasted less than 45 days, threw in the towel. Now, we're going to take a look at what this moment means for Sunak, for the UK and for India-UK ties. But first, let's just take a look at what this means for Rishi Sunak. He is, of course, uh, here as the fifth British Prime Minister since the beginning of the Brexit process. The process of the UK leaving the European Union began to be sworn in. Why do I say this? First, David Cameron stepped down in 2016 after a UK referendum voted to exit the European Union. It was seen as his defeat. Then, Theresa May stepped down in 2019 after losing a number of parliament votes over Brexit. Uh, Boris Johnson then came in. He won general elections in 2019. He led the UK out of the European Union, but then had to step down in 2022, earlier this year, over a series of scandals over maintaining COVID protocols at 10 Downing Street. This was called Partygate. And then there was Liz Truss. She became Prime Minister in September after winning the Conservative Party election, but then stepped down after 44 days after a number of economic missteps and U-turns, the loss of her finance and home ministers in quick succession. And now there's Rishi Sunak, who ran unsuccessfully against Truss and became PM this time uh, because he was the only Conservative MP who could win the minimum 100 MPs that are required to support him in time for the deadline. And therefore, he was unopposed for the job of Prime Minister. Now, Sunak, as I've been saying, has many firsts to his name. He's the first non-white, a child of immigrants of Indian and African origin. His grandparents were from undivided India, uh, so from Gujawala in Pakistan. Parents grew up in Kenya and Tanzania. And his wife, Akshata Murthy, daughter of Infosys founder Narayan Murthy, remains an Indian citizen, uh, which would make his children very unusually uh, half Indians in 10 Downing Street. Now, he's also the first Hindu, other than Benjamin Disraeli, who was Jewish. Uh, he's the only non-Christian to have the job. He's the youngest in modern times. In fact, they go back to 1783, actually. Although Blair and Cameron, David Cameron and Tony Blair, were 43 when they became prime minister. And he is the richest ever incumbent of 10 Downing Street. He's even richer than King Charles III. And obviously, that makes him look pretty elitist and part of a special club. Also went to Oxford uh, to study. So what are some of the big challenges ahead for Rishi Sunak that he's going to have to get through if he has to get successfully to the next general elections in 2025? The first challenge is, of course, the economy. It's all about the economy, really. Uh, will Sunak, who was in favor of Brexit, now be able to steer Britain through its economic troubles? And what are those really being caused by right now? What's compounding them? First, of course, was Brexit. And over all these years of Brexit, according to the Center for European Reform, not the most unbiased source, in the final quarter of 2021, GDP in the UK was 5.2% smaller, investment was 13.7% lower, and goods trade was 13.6% lower than what they would have been had the UK remained in the EU. So obviously, short term, there is that hit that the economy has taken. COVID, of course, the impact on every economy around the world, but the impact in the UK uh, also on the national healthcare system, which is in any case in some trouble. Then there is the Ukraine war and energy sanctions that have been imposed by the West. So there's impact on inflation for him. Supply chains and trucking routes have become much more complicated. Also the question, he's an economist. Uh, he certainly has been the uh, chancellor of the, uh, 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 of the exchequer. He's the finance minister. But can he be a war prime minister if Russia, Ukraine hostilities 
further worsen, how much will the UK get involved? And then, of course, uh, the UK economy is impacted by the political turmoil, the particular impact on the plummeting pound and market crashes that we have seen. The second big challenge for him, can he deal with opposition within his own party, the Conservative Party? Given that each prime minister's mandate has really grown weaker, uh, I've been listing for you each of these uh, Conservative Party leaders, and it seems as if each one, especially since Boris Johnson, has grown weaker uh, at a time when Rishi Sunak's colleagues, and I'm talking about Deputy Prime Minister, Justice Secretary Dominic Raab, a known face, Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt, Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, who was there with Boris Johnson as well, Home Secretary Suella Braverman, we'll speak a bit about her in a bit, and Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, who is in India actually, are all now much more powerful in the party. They've gained political weight with their new positions. The third challenge, he must face the major free trade agreement test. And that's the test with India, crafting a trade policy that is internationalist and complete the FTA with India while remaining true to Brexit promises on curbing immigration and increasing jobs within the UK. His decision, for example, to pick Home Secretary Suella Braverman, also uh, by coincidence of Indian origin, and then his responses in Parliament to her very right-wing anti-immigrant uh, policy statements that she's been making, even when she was in uh, Ms. Truss's cabinet, indicates that Rishi Sunak is going to have some trouble choosing down the road between these two very important uh, pillars in his government. Take a listen to what he said in Parliament at his first, what is called PMQ, Prime Minister's Questions, that he took from uh, the Labour Party MP uh, as well as the SNP. The first British Asian Prime Minister is a significant moment in our national story. And it's a reminder that for all the challenges we face as a country, Britain is a place where people of all races and all beliefs can fulfil their dreams. That's not true in every country, and many, didn't, and many didn't think that they would live to see the day when it would be true here. It's part of what makes us all so proud to be British. Was his Home Secretary right to resign last week for a breach of security? Prime Minister! Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank the uh, Ronald Gentleman for, for his kind and indeed generous uh, welcome to the dispatch box. I look forward to Prime Minister's question time with him, and I know that we will have no doubt robust exchanges, but I hope that they can also be serious and grown up. So I look forward to it. Well, uh, he, it, look, he, he asked uh, about the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised that. She raised the matter and she accepted her mistake. And that's why. That's why I was delighted to welcome back into a united cabinet that brings experience and stability to the heart of government. And let me tell you, Mr Speaker, what the Home Secretary will be focused on. She'll be focused on cracking down on criminals, on defending our borders, while the party opposite remains soft on crime and in favour of unlimited immigration. All right. A strong uh, statement being made by Rishi Sunak there in favour of Braverman. And he's also going to have to deal with opposition from his party constituents, you know, those that want a candidate in the 2025 elections who is winnable at a time when Labour, the chief opposition, is really running a 33-point lead over Conservatives. That's according uh, to a YouGov poll that was done last month about whether uh, who they'd vote for if there was a poll right away. He also has to deal with the idea that while he is Prime Minister, he has not been elected by the voter in the UK, nor has he been chosen by the Conservative Party Congress, as Liz Truss was. He's also going to face some amount of latent, under-the-surface racism over his ethnicity and his Indian origins. So let's now turn to Rishi Sunak's challenges when it comes to relations with India. And I can tell you, within his first few days in office, Sunak has clearly hit the floor running as far as India is concerned. He called Prime Minister Modi on October 27th, two days after he was appointed, discussed plans for fast-tracking ties and the FTA, thanked Prime Minister Modi for his support. In fact, PM Modi was due to travel to London once the deal is done. And although both sides have missed the Diwali deadline set by Modi and Boris Johnson for the free trade agreement, that visit could happen as soon as the Sunak government feels a framework, FTA at least, is ready. In addition, 
The two leaders, both Sunak and Modi, are expected to meet in mid-November on the sidelines of the Bali G20 summit. So we're seeing right at the top uh, a lot of meetings. Trade Policy Minister Greg Hans also told Parliament he spoke about the FTA with India. He said that the ambitious deal would see more rounds of talks very shortly and that a majority of chapters in the agreement had actually been met already. I think about 16 chapters have been met already. Then on October the 28th, UK Foreign Secretary made his first trip uh, to India after being reappointed to participate in the UN Security Council's Counter-Terrorism Committee meeting, the CTC meeting that's being held in Mumbai and Delhi. And he spoke over there. Listen in. Madam Chair, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today we remember the 166 people who were killed when terrorists attacked Mumbai in 2008 and the countless others who were injured in that attack. I express my deepest condolences to all the victims and their families. Among them were three British nationals and on behalf of His Majesty's Government, I honour and remember them today. This morning's ceremony reminds us of the human cost and the global impact of terrorism. And it reminds us why we must remain united and steadfast in our efforts to defeat it. 14 years ago, the United Nations Security Council condemned all acts of terrorism regardless of their motivation and pledged to combat this threat to international peace and security. The UK's determination to honour that pledge remains unwavering. And it's not just about vigilance and security focused on those that carry out terrorism. We know, we understand, that depriving terrorists of the funds to carry out such attacks, the funds to maintain their network, and the funds to recruit new members is one of the most effective tools against them. In the United Kingdom, detecting, preventing, and disrupting terrorist finance is a key strand of our defenses. We have a strong legislative framework, and our law enforcement agencies have wide-ranging powers to pursue terrorist financing. It is also a key strand of our counterterrorism cooperation with our international partners. As members of the United Nations Security Council Counterterrorism Committee, we have a special responsibility to protect and promote human rights in all our counterterrorism work. Madam Chair, the Excellencies, colleagues, friends, I thank you and I thank our hosts for organizing this important meeting and for putting victims at the heart of our work. And I pay tribute to India's leadership in the fight against terrorism over all these years. And I look forward to our further discussions over this weekend. We are here because we know that counterterrorism cooperation must continue to adapt and to evolve to match the new threats and emerging technologies. We must do all we can to prevent attacks like the one that took place here in Mumbai from ever happening again. That tragedy and each of the victims that we remember today remind us why our resolve must never waver and that what we do here today matters so very much. Thank you. So what really lies ahead? Earlier, I spoke with my colleague, the Hindu's correspondent in London, Sri Ram Lakshman, began by asking him really that Sunak has made this early start with India, sending his foreign secretary uh, here. But has he articulated a larger vision for India-UK ties?
Thanks for having me on your show, Suhasini. So yes, as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has already articulated his vision for UK-India ties, there was a call between Prime Minister Sunak and Prime Minister Modi on Thursday, and in readouts of that call, I basically think there will be two frameworks that guide ties in the so under the Sunak uh, administration. One is the 2030 roadmap. This is an agree agreed upon roadmap between India and the UK, where they're going to uh, upgrade the relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership. This will be done uh, through efforts across several dimensions, connecting people. This includes politics, defense, security, climate, health, and trade. And some of these aspects were touched upon in that phone call. Um, the other um, framework is the UK's Indo-Pacific tilt. Now, this is something that was articulated in the UK's integrated review of its foreign policy and its development policy and uh, security and defense policies in early 2021. But when it comes to the FTA, really, what are the current sticking points? How soon could this FTA uh, really be done? Remember, it's being negotiated by the third consecutive government now. So with regard to the FTA, some of the current sticking points uh, for the Indian side are the movement of professionals to the UK to deliver services, such as in the IT field, but also other fields and the movement of students. India is very keen on this movement of individuals who can deliver services. And this is a sensitive issue for the UK. Um, for the UK, they want a reduction in the 150% tariffs on alcoholic beverages being exported to India from the UK. Uh, they're particularly interested in scotch whiskey. They also want a reduction on tariffs for automobiles from the 60 to 100 percent range um, um, to lower levels. And uh, there's some reported progress on this. And currently a 30 percent tariff is being uh, looked at. Other concerns are the UK wants uh, data localization to be addressed in the free trade agreement. As you know, this is a big issue for India. Uh, even with the US, uh, the, the data policy is still being developed in India and data localization comes under this. India is hesitant to make commitments to the UK bilaterally while the policy itself is in flux in India. The UK is also seeking greater protections for its investors in India. It wants uh, uh, UK firms to have greater access to uh, government and tenders. Uh, these are some of the current sticking points. In terms of how soon we could have a deal, I don't think we'll have anything before November 17th, which is the uh, date when there will be a fiscal policy announcement, a budgetary announcement, the autumn statement by uh, the Sunak government. As you know, getting the economy and public finances back on track domestically, this is the pressing issue and all hands are on deck for that. Uh, perhaps there'll be some announcement uh, made by British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly uh, regarding progress on the trade deal when he's in India this weekend. I don't expect the trade deal, however, to be concluded by November 17th. Having said that, officials on both sides are, are saying that things are on track. This is what uh, Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal indicated last week, um, Indian High Commissioner, uh, in London, uh, Vikram Doraiswamy echoed those sentiments in a radio interview earlier this week. Greg Hans, who is a trade minister in the Department for International Trade in the UK, said that 16 out of 26 areas have been agreed. He made these comments in the House of Commons earlier this week. And he said negotiations will uh, resume shortly. They're working on this movement of persons to deliver services. And the general sentiment is um, that when there is a mutually beneficial trade deal to be signed, one will be signed and it will not be signed ahead of its time to meet arbitrary deadlines. Having said that, both sides are expressing optimism that something could happen in the foreseeable future. So I have to ask, we heard that um, very impassioned uh, defense of Suella Braverman, but really on immigration, what is the message that Rishi Sunak is sending out uh, by appointing Suella Braverman? So Rishi Sunak is sending out uh, intentionally or unwittingly several messages with the reappointment of Suella Braverman to the post of Home Secretary. Uh, yeah. The messages that he's sending out with a reappointment are um, that... Um, he 
is somebody who rewards loyalty. She was also one of the people to put up her hand uh, in support of Rishi Sunak last week when he made a bid again for number 10 Downing Street. The second uh, message he may be sending out is that he wants the Rwanda policy done. And he had expressed this view during the campaign in August. And by having her execute the policy, he doesn't actually have to get his hands dirty. I think think this could be one of the advantages for him. While he is an immigration hardliner, he does support the Rwanda policy. He's also been described as a pragmatist when it comes to immigration. Rishi Sunak is fundamentally a business, finance, economics person. And uh, he understands that some types of immigration are beneficial uh, to the UK economy at the moment. And uh, he will do whatever he needs to he in, to get the UK economy back on track, um, what he thinks is right for that. And I see some kinds of immigration as being a uh, part of his vision uh, to get the UK economy back on track. So he's currently in a very strong position relative to Suella Braverman. She's actually in a relatively, particularly weak position given all the Uh, issues that she's had in recent weeks, he can override, say, in an India-UK trade deal, he can override her, overrule her on uh, uh, any immigration clauses. And I see him doing that if he feels it's necessary to include um, uh, migration of individuals from India to the UK in order to get the trade deal done. Now, while congratulating him, Prime Minister Modi called Rishi Sunak part of the living bridge between India and the UK or the Indian diaspora. How difficult, how does Rishi Sonak really handle this mantle of the Indian origin of being the immigrant, of being the brown uh, Asian prime minister? He is first and foremost British. He does not go around regularly invoking his Indian roots. That's the short answer. In a context-specific manner, however, he does talk about his Indian roots. He said on his phone call with Prime Minister Modi, according to the readout, that he was a visual representation of the historical ties between the two countries. And earlier this year, in August, speaking to conservative, with a capital C, British Indians, he used language that implied he was part of the living bridge. And he talked about wanting to see a more reciprocal two-way relationship between the two countries. But in terms of regularly, in a day-to-day sense, raising his Indian roots, I don't see him doing that. He is, of course, also refreshed in this generation, his ties with India through his marriage. He's married to Akshata Murthy. In addition to that, he has cultural and religious practices that overlap with the cultural and religious practices of uh, the vast majority of Indians. Earlier this week, we saw pictures of him celebrating Diwali in number 10 Downing Street. Um, So there's a resonance over there. But in terms of him regularly invoking his Indian roots, I don't see him doing that. My colleague Sriram Lakshman reporting there from London. He'll keep you posted and you can, of course, see more of his writing on www.thehindu.com. Clearly, for the UK to have accepted a member of its immigrant community, a brown Asian, as its prime minister, is indeed a big moment for the former colonial and imperialist power. For India to celebrate our kinship to the new prime minister is also understandable. But beyond that, India's pride must be about the rise of minorities, of diverse ethnicities into our own political system. When it comes to bilateral ties, Sunak has shown that relations with India are a priority. But the big test for that will be in terms of outcomes like the FTA, not in terms of just intent, about allowing mobility and immigration as well as opening markets for each other in both Britain and India. Let's get you some reading recommendations now. In some of these books we have already spoken about on a previous worldview when we looked at Liz Truss's uh, Rise to Power. The first is called Going for Broke, The Rise of Rishi Sunak by Michael Ashcroft. I spoke about this, an uh, authoritative biography of Sunak. Also a new book called The Chancellors, Steering the British Economy in Crisis Times. This is by Howard Davies and looks at his work as finance minister. Uh, Two books on Brexit, 
uh, the eco economics and politics of Brexit, the realignment of British public life by Stephen Davies really looks at the impact on British politics. Another one, Brexit and British Politics by Jeffrey Evans and Anand Menon. This is a much more academic book. Uh, then there's a, a delightful book, which I think I've spoken about before, called Chums, how a tiny cast of Oxford Tories took over the UK by Simon Cooper and clearly looks at these charges of elitism against leaders like Boris Johnson and, of course, Rishi Sunak. And then there's Heroic Failure, Brexit and the Politics of Pain uh, by Fintan O'Toole, must read if you haven't already. Now, this book will be outdated by the time it's out in December, but presumably will be edited by now and so a little more up to date. It's called Out of the Blue, the Inside Story of Liz Truss and Her Explosive Rise to Power by Harry Cole and James Heal. These are well-known journalists. It should be an interesting read, even if she is out of power right now. Of course, in politics, you never say never. And then something about East African Indians. And I have spoken about books on the diaspora before. These two missed uh, my eye and I must recommend them. One is called Indians in Kenya, The Politics of Diaspora by Sana Ayer. Really a very interesting read. Also Indian Africa, Minorities of Indian Pakistani Origin in Eastern Africa by Adam Michel. Really looks at how the community grew over there, prospered. Many of them, of course, moved to the United Kingdom after. Uh, so that's all we have time for here on Worldview, but we do hope you'll join us again and we'll keep you updated on all that's happening in the world from, a, from the team here. Thanks for watching.